we start at the beginning. We're going to start with a chronological history. So tell me where and when were you born? Well, I was born October 1928 in the town of Jokjakarta, or Jokja for short, which was in the former Dutch East Indies hmm. on Java, the island of Java. My father was a school teacher, elementary school and later high school. And uh, my mother was also a teacher for a little while until the children started coming. And they migrated to the Indies, or as it is now called, Indonesia, uh -huh. uh, in the 1920s. And so that's where my two brothers, one older, one younger, and I were born. They all grew up in the former Dutch East Indies. I should perhaps explain that uh, what is now called Indonesia didn't exist. There was no country called Indonesia. It was just a collection of islands with independent tribes for a long time until the Dutch came in Oh, around 1600 is when it started that the Dutch began to colonize the islands. There are about 15,000 or so of them, most of them very small, but some of them quite big. And Java was one of the bigger ones, uh, and actually the center for the Dutch governing more and more of all those little islands that stretch from fairly close to Ceylon, India, mm. all the way to close to Australia. And uh, the Dutch managed to more and more get all those islands together under one central government, which was in Java. And to have all the tribes become subject to the same laws, uh, eventually the same language, uh, which the Dutch really imported partly from the north of what is now Indonesia and made the lingua franca, the general language that uh, was used in the Indies until the Second World War. And that's when the freedom fighters also began to had organized by the Indonesians. And after the Second World War, it became the Free Republic of Indonesia with a common language and a common governance. And again, the central government still being in the island of uh, Java. And Yogyakarta was one of the major cities on Java. And my father was in the Dutch language school the uh, headmaster. Uh, should I just go on like this? Yeah, well, I'm just curious about um, that. So how? what year were you born? 1928. 28. And so the Dutch the, the Dutch government was in control. Of, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And were you all considered Dutch citizens? Oh, yeah. Then? Yeah. Yeah. The, the Dutch had a different idea about uh, fraternizing with the natives of their colonies. Quite different from the British in India. The British did not, as a rule, fraternize much. But the Dutch did with the natives in Indonesia. And as a result, uh, there were many more mixed marriages, or at least relationships, between Dutch, white, citizens coming from the Netherlands to help run the colonies and the native women. And over the centuries, since they started around 1600, so that was uh, more than 300 years, there were a lot of mixed marriage children born. Uh, actually, my mother was one of those. Oh. Uh, but she married my father, who was 100% Dutch, 
And so my brothers and I are one quarter Indonesian, uh, as it would be called now. Uh, since 1600, there grew more and more a bond between the Dutch and the natives of the colony, which to this day exists, hmm. uh, particularly after the Dutch began to start schools where the natives could go and learn also the Dutch language so that later they could start working in Dutch uh, governance and businesses and uh, really penetrating more and more from the natives into the general culture of the Dutch East Indies. Mm. Maybe it's interesting to know that the leaders of the early days of Free Indonesia all spoke Dutch fluently and when they were amongst one another, they would speak Dutch with one another because they came from different original tribes in Indonesia and so their first native language was not the general language that the Dutch helped develop as the common language for Indonesia. Hmm. So they rather talked Dutch with each other because at least that they all could understand quite well. It was kind of weird for foreigners who came there as journalists. I knew one of them. Hmm. He said that was one of the strangest things. When amongst one another, the native leaders of Indonesia began to speak informally, they would usually speak Dutch, huh. which was kind of strange. Right. To what, the, uh, what was the ethnicity of the original indigenous people there? Very mixed. Okay. It went from more close to the Indian uh, people from India, oh. all the way east to quite other different ethnic groups, to the ones close to Australia that were much more close to the aboriginals of Australia. And that is still true today. Hmm. The Papuas, for instance, in New Guinea, right. in the far eastern part of Indonesia, are an entirely different kind of ethnic group than, for instance, the people from Java or the people from Sumatra. Uh, and there were literally hundreds of languages spoken before the Dutch came. And as often as not, they were at war with each other too. Uh, so the Dutch made it much more a unit than it had ever been before. Mm. Indonesia was a name, but it was a name for a large group of islands, mm. just like Polynesia still is, right. or Melanesia, or Micronesia. Uh, so Indonesia was all those 15,000 and more islands that mm. stretch from Ceylon to Australia. Right. When did the... Um the Islam influence, the Muslim well, influence. Well, that was after about 800, 900, until that time, if there was a dominant religious group, it was the Hindus mixed with Buddhism, which you still find, for instance, on some islands in Indonesia, like Bali. Mm -hmm. Bali was still much more Hindu and Buddhist than any of the other islands until today. That is true. But then came Islam uh, and Islamic missionaries in the 800 to 900 span, I think. And that conquered more and more of all those islands west of New Guinea except there were still some that remained Christian mm. after they had been Christianized by Christian missionaries. Like, it's, like it is still true today for islands like uh, the Moluccas, like Ambon, uh, which is a quite different ethnic group too than for instance Java or Sumatra. How they still manage to now keep it in unity is one of the miracles of hmm. 
contemporary civilization, I guess. Right. They've. Uh, they're, they're, I'm, I've heard the Moluccans in our. A lot have moved to the Netherlands, right? I mean, maybe not that recently, but true. previously. It, yes, because many Moluccan young men, because they were Christians, were part of the Dutch colonial armed forces. And uh, they fought also against the freedom fighters of Indonesia after the Second World War when Indonesia wanted to become truly independent, which the Dutch had sort of promised they eventually would be, but not right then. But they wanted it right then. And uh, uh, the Wallachians, especially the Ambonese, often had to fight against other Indonesians in the first two years after, four years after the Second World War. And there they were when Indonesia became a free country and independent. What were they going to do? Many of them, his wives and children, moved to the Netherlands, hmm. where at least they were safe. And they were hoping eventually they might be able to go back but that never happened. Hmm. Well, let's get back to your history. Uh, what are you? What are your early memories of, of your childhood? It was paradise for us. Hmm. The uh, ruling classes were, of course, more, mostly Dutch, and if you were part of that, then you had a privileged position in many ways. We had very good relations with the natives, but it was never quite a matter of equality. That did not happen until well after the Second World War. But for us children, white children, or mostly white children, it was paradise. Uh, I remember it as such great pleasure still that occasionally I want to go back. Uh, uh, it was it was great. Yes, like in what way the uh, you had schooling, you had good education. And, yeah, it, that was all in Dutch. And there was the we food and school. clothing and all that was yeah real. At home we talked Dutch, uh -huh. uh, and we went to a Dutch language school as children. Uh, we had friends from the pure Dutch or Topox as we. Hmm. called them to pure Indonesian native and everything in between. And they all were in the Dutch language school to be found. Uh, and the sports club, I played soccer with kids from every ethnic group you might imagine, including Chinese hmm. very often because there were very many Chinese in, uh, in the Indies that had migrated over the centuries. Uh, so it was, it was a very mixed kind of group that we lived with, but we were Dutch. And was it mixed religiously or was it mostly Christian then? The... No, it was also mixed religiously. Oh. Uh, the natives were usually from Islamic background. Maybe some were yeah, more toward Buddhism, but most of them would be Islam, and then there were the Dutch, who mostly were Christian. But then there were the Chinese, who also had their own religions, and there were some Jewish people. I had some Jewish friends, uh, and there were Japanese. Uh, Indonesia always has been uh, a mix of peoples. And everybody got along, okay? At that time, mostly. Yeah. But there were some areas in the Indies where people still were wanting to become independent right away. For instance, in northern Sumatra. And until the 20th century, there had been fighting between the Dutch colonial army and the locals. Mm -hmm. Uh, but not on islands like Java, uh, 
or most of Sumatra, all the other ones. Uh, so it was by and large for us, especially on Java, a very peaceful kind of life. Right. So everything mixed. Right. And you went all of was through high school. What how far did you well, your education? No, in... I was born in twenty eight, mm -hmm. so in thirty five I started elementary school, uh, first grade, and went through elementary school all the way uh, until the war in Europe had started and the Nazis had invaded the Netherlands. Now that was in the town of Medan, which is on Sumatra, where my father was at that time the uh, uh, headmaster of a high school. But my older brother had graduated from high school in 1940 when the Germans invaded and occupied the Netherlands. So he could not go to the Netherlands, which was the normal way for promising young white people to send their children, go to the Netherlands, get further educated there. So he enlisted in the Dutch Navy, in a naval air force, and was stationed in a town on Java, Surabaya, in the far eastern part of Java. And that's when my father asked to be placed in the high school in uh, the town of Surabaya, and that happened indeed. So in 41, August 41, we moved to Surabaya on Java, which was very important for us to be together again, close at least to our, my oldest brother. Right. Uh, so I grew up first in, in Java, then my father was stationed in Maidan, and then in Maidan I went all the way through elementary school. And then I was going to go to high school, but we moved to Surabaya. So there I started the first year of the five-year high school, mm -hmm. which didn't last very long because it started in September 41, and in December 41 started the war with Japan, Pearl Harbor, and the Netherlands immediately, including the Dutch East Indies, immediately declared war on Japan the next day. And so a few weeks later, the bombardment started by Japanese Air Force on Surabaya, which was the major uh, port for the Dutch Naval Air Force there in uh, Surabaya. And that was the end of high school. For me. And you were like 14? I was 13. 13, 14. When the war started. Yeah. I had just turned 13 in October. So, uh, no more school when the bombardments really got going. So after December of 41, I did not see school again until August of 1946. So what was life like during that time? Well, the Japanese came in March of 1942. The Dutch had surrendered, the Dutch in, in the Indies surrendered. And uh, the really white Dutchman, like my father, almost right away went into concentration camps or internment camps at least. The whites in the army were, of course, immediately in March interned by the Japanese and sent off to work in places like Cambodia, Vietnam, the, 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 uh, Indochina for us. Many of them ended up working on that famous Burma <laughs> uh, railroad. Right. And uh, 
But my father, as a civilian, was interned in a civilian camp by the Japanese a few months later, like in May or June of 42. My older brother was who knows where. We had no idea whether he was alive or not, and if so, where he might be. Captured by the Japanese or not. Turned out that he had managed to escape with other officers mm -hmm. to uh, Australia later and was stationed in the armed forces of General MacArthur. Wow. Uh, How long did, before you knew what had happened to him? That was in uh, after Japan had fallen and there was some communication possible. So that was in September 45. So all that time you didn't know if no. he was dead or no, what had happened? Oh. Most of the time we didn't know either whether my father was still oh. alive in concentration camp yeah. or not. Right. Because he disappeared from our town in 42 and we never, at first we knew he was in a camp there and then later he was moved and we didn't know where he ended up. It turned up that he ended in an internment camp in Western Java, mm -hmm. but we didn't find that out until August of 45, when the Japanese had capitulated and some communications began. Mm -hmm. And that's when we found out that he was still alive. Yeah. We didn't know about our, uh, uh, our older brother until a month later. And I still didn't know until November, <laughs> because this is a complicated story you're asking when you not tell. Let's go back, okay? Okay. S uh, December 41, Japan starts the war with United the United States. States. Yeah. And the Netherlands immediately joined the United States in declaring war with Japan. There was hardly any fight between the Dutch forces and the Japanese when the Japanese started to invade the Dutch East Indies. The Japanese were so far superior mm -hmm. in everything uh, that it took a week. So if I'm Thinking right now, March 8, 1942, the Dutch East Indies ended to exist. They no longer existed. It was now Indonesia in principle, but Japan occupied until August of 1945 when the atom bombs made the war to end. Right. So, a couple of months after the capitulation of the Dutch, my father went into a concentration camp and my mother was left with two young teenage kids. I was 13, my younger brother was 11. Yeah. And we had to try to make do during the occupation of Japan. Uh, my mother did not have to go into a internment camp because she was half, 50% Indonesian. Indonesian. Right. And so we didn't have to go either. But there was no money. The banks had been impounded by the Japanese. There was little money left from the Dutch days. So from then on, uh, my mother and us two kids had to fend for ourselves, which we managed to do. It wasn't always easy, but uh, I started working when I was 14, just turned 14. What kind of work? Oh, I did all kinds of things. First, I had a little moving company, because mm. people were kicked out of their houses regularly by the Japanese who needed homes for mm. their officers and families and so to live. So within I think a month after the Japanese occupied the town of Surabaya, uh, my parents were told, get out of your house. Mm -hmm. This whole street and the streets next to it are 
going to be homes for Japanese officers. So leave everything in the house, uh, furniture and so on. You can take your private possessions along, and books and, and some linen and uh, uh, I mean my violin mm -hmm. uh, had to go get somewhere a place to live. We moved, I think, more than a dozen times during that occupation, the Japanese, from one place to another. You just looked for a place that was empty, so <laughs> you moved in there. Really? It wasn't like... you were kicked out of that. Really? Again. Wow. So it was an adventurous life, I'll, yeah. I'll tell you. Uh, I, uh, so people were kicked out of their houses often, and sometimes could take some uh, things along when they moved, some furniture and so on. Were there Japanese soldiers everywhere? Oh, were yeah. there guns? Oh, yeah. People yeah, with yeah. guards? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and were they brutal? Did they? Uh, yes. Yes. You had to really be careful. I did not have to watch it myself, but a cousin of mine, who was also free uh, for a while, had to watch one uh, of the public punishments meted out by the Japanese if they had caught some people doing something like stealing or, or robbing people. or The worst, of course, was so-called espionage. Was there an underground, an active resistance yeah, going on? Yeah, it didn't amount to much. Mm. They, they never managed to get off the ground very much. But if they were caught, they were beheaded. Mm. Wow. Uh, and my cousin had to watch that once mm. in the public square, and people who didn't know what was going on were herded into that square and couldn't leave until there were enough of them, because it was a busy square usually. And then the Japanese had set up a little platform and gave a demonstration. If they had caught somebody stealing from the Japanese, that meant depending on how bad it had been, one or two hands cut off mm. right away there as a saber. And the worst, of course, was espionage, and then it was beheading mm. in public by sword. Mm. <coughs> well, I never had to see that, fortunately. Mm. Good. But yeah. My cousin did. Mm. And there would be Japanese soldiers on the square watching among the people, making sure they were looking. And then they were told, see, this is what we do when you act wrong, according to our laws. And it was pretty effective, usually. So and this was almost the three years that you lived that way? Yes, from March 42 through August 1945. Hmm. So it was three and a half years only. So by this time, though, the, the Germans were occupying the Netherlands, right, in Europe. Yes. But yes. even though that was going on, they still had an, a government, a Dutch government in the Indies. Oh, yeah, that was independent. That was, oh, it was independent. It, it was, for, for many years before the war already, there was the separate and to a large extent independent Dutch East Indies government. Oh. And they were the ones who ran the East, uh, including the schools and many businesses. And but they had no the, connection to the Dutch in the in Europe. Well, they, yes, when, when it came finally to it, the okay. Dutch government in the Hague had supervision over the okay. Indonesian one. That's where the Governor General was right. appointed in the Hague. Hmm. Uh, that's where major uh, officers in the army were appointed to then send to the Indies. Right. So I, I remember watching a film after the war where the Dutch were trying to make the case to the world court that they wanted to get Indonesia back again under yes. its control. And they weren't successful in doing that. No. Do you know anything about that period? And, oh, yeah. Yeah. That was a big story, of course. And now my parents and my brother, by that time, were in the Netherlands, well, except my older brother. He still served in that 
the Dutch forces. And I should add, the Dutch Navy in Indonesia always remained directly under the Dutch in Europe. Okay. Not the armed forces, the, the armies, but the, the Navy. So my, my brother uh, served in the Dutch Naval Air Force. And that was the same, whether it was in Indonesia or in the Netherlands. Okay. But for uh, several years then, he was not all the time at least, was not at home in the Netherlands. But his wife and children were for a while. Mm. She is Australian. Right. He married her at the end of the war oh. in Australia. So we are a very mixed family. Yeah. Well, there was quite a bit of a, uh, immigration to Australia by Dutch people, too, I think, wasn't there? I had an aunt. Yes, that... th yes, there were. Uh, it was mostly, though, Canada, United States, and then Australia right. and New Zealand. So when did you, your family then, so you're, you're reunited after the war, and that's when your, your well, family moves to the stages, Netherlands? In stages. In stages. Okay. Uh, because the war suddenly ended because of the Atom War. Nobody was prepared for that. Not the Allied forces, mm -hmm. and certainly not the Japanese and the Indonesians and the Dutch in the Indies. So there was a vacuum. Uh, officially, the British had to take over control from the Japanese in the western part of the Pacific War. The eastern part, like the Philippines and so on, and all those islands the Japanese had occupied during the uh, Second World War, that was the Americans who were to take over from there. But the British were even less prepared to take things back from the Japanese than the Americans were. Uh, Lord Longbatten, who was the commander of the British forces, also seemed not to be in such a hurry to reoccupy the Dutch East Indies. Mm -hmm. He was much more interested, naturally, of course, to go right back to places like Malaysia, Indochina, Singapore in particular. And so that's where very quickly British forces came, but not the Dutch East Indies. Mm. Now, Japan capitulated August 15, 45. The first scouts of the Allied forces coming to the Dutch East Indies after the Japanese had capitulated was the end of September, a month and a half later. In the meantime, Mountbatten had told the Japanese forces that you keep order, mm. which the Japanese did fairly well, but not everywhere, and not in Surabaya, where my mother and my younger brother and I still were. My father was in the western part of Java, where the British came first to reoccupy what was then still Batavia, now Jakarta, and a couple other major uh, towns in Western Java. So my father saw British soldiers, uh, I think, for the first time in October of 42, two months after Japan had capitulated. Yeah, 40. Until that time, there were the Japanese as the ones to keep order. Right. But in the meantime, Indonesians began to organize, uh, into militia groups, it was a chaos. Mm -hmm. There were some attempts to create a more regular army mm -hmm. for the Indonesians, mostly of soldiers, ex-soldiers, who had served in the Dutch armed forces, mm -hmm. so at least knew about discipline and, and organization and weapons and so on. But that was a relatively small part of what began to rise up. It was much more the young males, mm -hmm. the pagudas. The word literally means young. Mm -hmm. uh, 
they started to organize militia bands on their own, often independent from the official mm. armed forces that Indonesia was trying to build. And that was particularly true in the town of Surabaya. Where you were. Where, where my mother and my brother and I were. Right. And so we didn't see any British troops at all until I was already in a camp interned by Indonesian Pumuda forces. I'll have to explain that a little bit. Just by yourself you were in a camp? Or yes, because... Uh, and you're what, 15 now? I or was 16. 16? Yeah. Barely. And, uh, you know, let me think, there was, there was, uh, I was just, I just turned 17 when I got picked up and forced with a couple thousand others in a particular old Dutch jail. Hmm. So I call that my time in jail. It was just the, the, the jail as, as it had been used by the Dutch for native uh, people they had arrested for one thing or another. But you were locked up there. You couldn't. Oh, yeah. You couldn't leave, right? No, no. We were locked up. We had to be eventually liberated mm. by British forces, wow. who finally came. But in the meantime, the Bermudas, the young Indonesians, or the rebels as we called them at that time, had taken over from the Japanese. Mm. They had stormed the, the uh, arsenals of the Japanese. They had taken over the whole city by the end of September from the Japanese. And that's when they began to arrest more and more of the Dutch, including those who had just come back from Japanese concentration camps and had managed to get out of there in other places on Java and came back to Surabaya. So the promoters had taken over. That's when British forces came. I think that was uh, sometime during the month of October. Mm. I had already been picked up by then when the Pramudas started arresting more and more Dutch boys mm -hmm. above the age of 14 and put them in a camp. Did they do anything with you? Did they try to? Well, that depended on when you were picked up and when they first brought you. I was very lucky. Mm -hmm. I've been very fortunate that whole time. The whole Second World War, uh, but there were those who were picked up either earlier or later. Uh, there were some who were brutally tortured and killed because they were brought to one place in Surabaya, which became a bloodbath. Mm -hmm. There were literally many dozens of Dutch killed mm. in a brutal way by those Indonesians who had started lusting after killing all the Europeans. Mm. Uh, I was lucky. I got right away put into the jail. Uh, we did have to run the gauntlet mm. uh, when we were literally kicked off the uh, trucks and told to get in there, there was the front door to the jail complex. It was a huge complex, this whole city block, really. Uh, and between the truck and that open door had amassed other young ones, some with knives, mm -hmm. many with those sharp pointed uh, bamboo right. spear. spears. Right. Uh, there were no arm, no 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 guns. Uh, but well, you had to run from the truck to 
the uh, the open door to the gate really to the jail complex and you had to try to make your way through all the most, mostly teenagers uh, who were hacking in on you one way or the other. Mm. I was very lucky then. I was small mm. and I was agile and I was on one of the trucks closer to the uh, open gate. So I managed to get through with very little uh, of, of uh, Injury, blows, right. blows and on to my head. Uh, but one of my classmates from me just uh, that we had still school got killed there, mm -hmm. right there. At this, he uh, he got wounded by spears, and he died that night in the jail. So that that was that was pretty exciting, yeah. <laughs> to uh, say the least. Uh, the women and children, and my brother was still. My younger brother was so young that they didn't want to pick him up yet. Uh, had been moved to what had been an internment camp for the Japanese. Uh, and uh, they just waited to see what would happen. So they were there, with thousands of other women and children, and I was in the jail by myself with close to 3,000 men and boys, the Dutch. And while I was there, uh, the British landed some troops in the harbor of Surabaya. There was no resistance. Uh, they surprised the Indonesians probably because they landed from their ships that they had sent from Singapore. So that's when the negotiations began between mm. the British troops and the Indonesians who had set up a sort of temporary government right. in Indonesia. They, Were they feeding you in those camps? Were they taking care of you at all? Or? Well, we got some food mm. because Sukarno, who was by then the, the leader already of the nationalists, okay who once came specifically to try to calm things down a little to Surabaya. We didn't know that in the jail, but that's what I found out later. Okay. And he had managed to calm down somewhat the Pamudas and to make them more willing to work together with the official wow. forces that Indonesia had been building up. So he goes back that far because he was in charge oh, of the oh, for yes. a long time after that. Yeah, right? he he began to collaborate with the Japanese during the occupation, uh -huh. and he then already got the promise from them that eventually Indonesia would become free under Japanese tutelage. Right, uh, and so after the war, he immediately, when the Japanese capitulated, he immediately became the leader of the people who, the nationalists, uh, who wanted to become free right away. Mm -hmm. That's another interesting story, by the way. The Pabudas forced him, almost at gunpoint, after having kidnapped him and other national leaders, uh, to declare Indonesia free. That was on August 17th. The Japanese capitulated the 15th. And they forced Sukarno to declare from the steps of his house <laughs> in Jakarta uh, that he declared now Indonesia to be free. Uh, and he, he wasn't quite ready to do that yet at the time, because he was still thinking possibly in terms of some negotiations with the Dutch. <laughs> Am I going too fast? No, or? it's beautiful. I love it. You just, it it's I'm learning chaos. so much. It was totally chaos. The whole, right. The whole after the war period in Indonesia for the first year. Right. Uh, well, there we were. My mother with my younger brother, together with a bunch of 
there's a whole lot of, of uh, Dutch women and children. And there I was in the jail. We had no idea of each other, whether we were alive mm. or not. And they saw where we were. Uh, and that came the British. And then started a couple of months of even more chaos in that town. Because many of the Indonesians didn't want to see the British either. Mm. They wanted everybody to leave and be Indonesia for the Indonesians. But the British, by that time, uh, had collected enough materials and soldiers and so on to be able to put their will on the table mm. and negotiate from a power, from strength. And there were all kinds of little fights between the two groups. Uh, the first thing that the British tried to do was occupy that part of the city where those women and children were. Because they already had plans to try to evacuate them, get them out of, out of harm. Uh, but there were fights between their forces and the Indonesians. One British general was killed uh, when he tried to walk into a large group of Indonesians and try to sort of make peace, and they weren't going to have any of it. And he was killed right there. Wow. Uh, but, so that made the British mad, and they sent more troops from Singapore. So that came finally more and more fighting and a sort of stand still for a bit and the British then, which was really kind of dumb, made an ultimatum to the Indonesians and said, well, we have now our troops in the harbor and we have still some in the city. Uh, by tomorrow morning, six o'clock or whatever it was, uh, we want you to lay down your arms uh, and surrender them to us, and then we will take over the town. Well, the Indonesians didn't have any willingness or, or so to even listen to that. So there was a sense there for a while. The ultimatum wasn't immediately enforced. And that's when the British started to evacuate the women and children as much as possible from the center of town to the harbor, from the harbor onto ships, British ships, and then off to a few, another harbor in Java, but most of them to Singapore. Mm. That's what happened to my mother and my younger brother. Wow. So there, they were in Singapore, which was run entirely by the English, by the British, and uh, they got a place in a refugee camp there. And uh, they were finally really free. Did you know that they had? No. no. We had no idea what had happened to the women and children. They were in the jail, cooped up. Well, then the British renewed their ultimatum. And this, this time they meant it, because the women and children had been free and the Indonesians didn't want any of that. So I still remember very clearly, six o'clock in the morning, the British started to invade the town of Surabaya from the harbor. Mm -hmm. The jail where I was was fairly close to the harbor. And what the British did first was send little planes, spitfires, mm -hmm. let's say, to strike all around the jail. They just kept going. I remember that still very well. That was how we woke up. <laughs> and they had sent a small force uh, with one tank and a cannon on that tank to the jail while it was still dark. And so at daybreak, around six o'clock, they were right outside the jail. A few trucks, there's a small force, 
led by a Dutchman hmm. who knew the jail because he had been in there when it was by the Japanese, hmm. a concentration camp, so he could be a guide. And so there they were. And then the strifing was over. And then we heard shots like cannonballs. It turned out to be that cannon hmm. that shot a big hole in the outside wall of the jail. And uh, that's when in the cells, a couple of guys climbed on the shoulders of other guys to look out through the tiny little uh, window that was there. And they, the one closest to me could report seeing what was happening. And he saw that hole mm. <laughs> shot in the outside wall. And so very excitedly, he started giving an eyewitness report of what he then saw. He, he saw some British troops come in. They were actually British Indian troops, mm. Gurkhas, we called them. Uh, th there were different kinds of Indian troops, uh, but we called them all Gurkhas. Mm. He didn't know any better. And he reported that how they were coming into that, through that hole, shooting all over the place with their stand guns. <laughs> rifles. So it was very exciting. Uh, and they made headway very quickly because they were very experienced soldiers. They had fought against the uh, Germans in Africa, that regiment. They had fought against the Japanese in Indochina and Malaysia. So they knew what they were doing. And there was poor Indonesian juveniles that were occupying the jail and guarding us I had no idea. How, we how big was that force of the ju the juveniles guarding that? You think? A little over a hundred. Okay. Yeah. And were they well organized? They were a well organized militia or were they pretty they much? They were an organized militia. Okay. They had some weapons from the Japanese. Right. And they expected war. Uh -huh. But the night before, the evening before, they gathered in the uh, open territory in the middle of the jail, kind right. of the square, and they were chanting and chanting mm. and chanting. That was one of the most eerie and threatening kinds of music, if you can call it music, ah. I remember. And that went on for hours. So we knew in ourselves mm. something is up, something is going to happen tomorrow. And they were all indigenous they were Indonesian. all Indonesian, in, indigenous Indonesians, yeah. yes. Young men. Young men. Because practically all of the mixed race people and you know, who lived right among the Indonesians choose to identify as the Dutch. They were Dutch. They called themselves Dutch. Mm. They spoke the Dutch language mm. with little pieces of Indonesian mixed in, so they had their own dialect, as it were, mm -hmm. but they regarded themselves as Dutch, and when the Indonesians wanted independence, they turned against those Indonesians, not with them. There were very, very few who did that. Uh, so, in the jail, those were all Indonesian young men, right. Kamudas, and they were no match for those very well-trained and experienced British soldiers, uh, British Indian soldiers. Right. And so they, they managed to kill practically all of those mm. guards, the juveniles, and they lost only one out of a couple of dozen. Uh, so all of a sudden we were free. And later that day, uh, we were all transported to the harbor. Some of us had to walk. Some of them, I was a lucky one, uh, could climb on a truck that went back and forth and were free there in the harbor of Surabaya. Put on, put on boats then or? No, no, we were first housed in old barracks. Okay. That were there. Uh, barracks for materials and barracks for personnel. Mm. 
uh, I was in one of the barracks for uh, materials. And it uh, uh, lasted several weeks. And it was there that I heard that most of the women and children who had been in Surabaya when all this started had been evacuated to Singapore. Right. We didn't have names, we didn't have lists. There was uh, little communication yet, but there was some news. Uh, that I also knew then that my father was still alive. How did I you didn't hear? know about my brother. How did you hear about your father from the British? Well, we then? had heard that just before uh, the, the British came to Surabaya. Uh, we had an Indonesian friend who had gone to the town where my father was, still in what used to be the Japanese concentration camp, and he had found my father. He had been a pupil, a student of my father in high school, and he did find him, because that's where a lot of the ones from Surabaya had been put, in the town of Bandung. Mm -hmm. And so he found him, and my father had heard through the, the British, who were there then, that my older brother was still alive. Mm -hmm. And he had managed to send that news to us mm -hmm. by telegraph. Uh -huh. There was some communication just beginning to get going again. Was he in Australia then? Is that where he was? or did, That or? was where my brother was, yes. Okay. He had just married a couple of months before uh -huh. uh, an Australian girl. Right. But he was still with the Dutch Naval Air Force, which was still at that time part of the American forces hmm. that had just come almost all the way to Japan, right. island hopping. What we think about is the war in the Pacific, right? That yes, was the, this is all the Pacific. Yeah. That was the war that I experienced. Right. Uh, so oh. there we were. Uh, and I had to guess where they all were. Well, I knew where my father was, but I couldn't possibly get to the other end of Java. But I heard that it was quite possible that my mother and younger brother were in Singapore. So right. I thought, well, let's try to get to Singapore. Okay. Now, there was a lot of traffic between Surabaya uh, and Singapore. How far would Singapore, how far is Singapore from, J from Java or Surabaya? Well, by ship, it was two nights. Okay. So, uh, not all that far, but several hundred miles at least. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing now. I don't really know. Right. Uh, yeah. So I managed somehow to get a ride on one of those boats that frequent the ships, a landing ship that had been used during the war too. The landing ship. What was the, uh, the number again? Oh, it doesn't matter. 210, I believe. But like sure. a military oh, yeah. landing it, it, ship. It right. was all military ships that went back and forth okay. with materials and personnel okay. and so on between Surabaya and Singapore. And I went to the physician that had been uh, put in charge of that camp in Surabaya then, the uh, refugee camp where I was. And I said, well, I've heard that my mother is in Singapore. Well, then, what did he know? What did I know? Mm -hmm. But I acted like I had heard that she was in Singapore, and my younger brother. And uh, I think I need to go there because uh, I have asthmatic bronchitis, which was true, by mm -hmm. the way. And I'm afraid that that will flare up again. So he wrote me a little note. Okay. And with the note, I went to the camp commander. And uh, I told him, well, he, this doctor thinks I really need to go to Singapore. Oh, well, he put me on a ship that was going the next week. So after uh, about a month in that, uh, in that refugee spot there, in the harbor of Surabaya, I got on a landing ship and that took 
me and a couple hundred other people to Singapore, where I landed two nights later. We left in the afternoon, and two nights later, early in the morning, we uh, got to Singapore. Mm. And can I finish this by telling how I did manage to find my mother? No, yeah, tell us. That's one of the yes. great, great moments of our various lives. Was there one big camp brother, or were there little... No, Singapore is an island, you know. Okay. And uh, most of the British, first and later the Japanese, and then after the capitulation of Japan, the British again had built a number of camps there for different groups of people. See, Singapore was so central to all traffic in that part of the Pacific, mm. that just what everybody who wanted to go home to either farther into the Pacific or to Europe had to go to Singapore for a stay over. So there were troops from, of course, the British. There were many Dutch troops. There were Australian troops. There were American troops. There were French troops. And then there were all these refugees. <laughs> concentration camps and uh, uh, from refugee camps elsewhere in the area around Singapore on all those islands there mm -hmm. from Sumatra all the way to the Philippines. Uh, well, so I landed there early in the morning and hitched a ride on a jeep. You always hitched the rides. They were easy to find. It, Lots of military vehicles were crisscrossing all over the place, within the city and between the, the inner city of Singapore and other places on the island. So I got a ride on a, in a jeep to a camp, one of the refugee camps where a lot of Dutchmen were, I was told. Okay. So I get there, turns out it was a camp for men and boys and no oh, women there. Oh, so I said, well, do you know anything about... Well, they said there is a big camp, lots of women and children. Uh, it's called the Wilhelmina camp. Mm. Wilhelmina was the queen of the Netherlands. Right. See if you can get a ride there. So that was in the middle, toward the middle of the afternoon, uh, of the day. So I got a right to that camp. So there I am, outside the camp, there's a big open gate, and there are all those houses. It used to be a camp for British soldiers, apparently, before the war. And yeah, in the middle of it, I could see a huge tent, hmm. uh, apparently for uh, music to be played, and for, uh, well, sort of like a, a bar, mm. uh, at least, well, not, not alcoholic stuff so much, but the, the deli, you could get something. So I thought, well, probably the office, main office of the camp will be close to that tent. So I'll first go there and see if I can find that office. So I go down the road, this is blazing hot around one o'clock in the afternoon. It was a blue sky. I remember that very well. Uh, so I start walking toward that tent. And I'm halfway down that little piece of road. And I see from the other end uh, going to that tent. On the end of the road, I see my mother and my younger brother. And so, of course, we recognize each other from a distance, and we get a reunion close to the tent, uh, right smack in the middle of that camp. I don't think I've ever seen my mother as dazed and, of course, happy uh, as at that moment. Because there she was, she had no idea whether I was still alive, and if so, where I might be on Java. Uh, and 
then she said, all of a sudden, literally, out of a blue sky, <laughs> there comes walking to her the son of hers that yeah. was lost. She knew by that time that my older brother was still alive okay. and my father was alive and she had my younger brother with her. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that was quite quite a day. I bet. I was just wondering, you know, what their, uh, ev your evolving worldview at this time, or was there any sort of religious, spiritual oh. stuff about God's intervention in this, or how was there well, any feelings like that? Or oh yeah, yeah, of course. So I grew up in a Protestant nest. Okay. My father was sent by missionaries in the Netherlands, Protestant missionaries, to the Dutch East Indies to work in Dutch language school. Okay. So at first he was a missionary, but he became quite disappointed after a number of years with the attitude of uh, the people there in the Indies toward the natives. And that included my mother, who was half native. Okay. And so he resigned from the missionary school and he joined the governmental school okay. for the rest of his period in the Indies. Uh -huh. Uh, which was some 13 years yet. Right. So, uh, but he, he was a Protestant. But did they bring you up with oh, religious yeah. Oh, yeah. We stories went to church and church? Every Sunday. Okay. We read the Bible uh -huh. uh, at dinner. Okay. Uh, at the Dutch at practice. Dinner right. table. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was, he was an organist in the Dutch church. Okay. Uh, he was also the choir director. Uh, that was really his right. his his avocation. He, he he had a good job okay. as a teacher, but his real love was music. He was mostly self-taught, but he was very good. Was he brought up in a religious family? Oh yeah, thing? his yeah. father was an uh, his father was an uh, evangelist. Ah. That is, in those days, that meant. You go out, you start preaching to people on the street, let's say it, you build up gradually some following and eventually it becomes enough to Have become a church, a church yeah. and then they call a real minister mm. and you go somewhere else and start all over. Okay. So his father yeah. was, was in that sense a real missionary right. evangelist in the Netherlands. Yeah. And uh, that's how he grew up, very right. pious people. Uh -huh. uh, so were you developing at this time any kind of worldview? What was? Oh yeah. What were you I thinking had, about? I had all kinds of questions. Uh -huh. I had many questions about those stories in the Bible that you had to believe. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I've always been kind of skeptic, <laughs> later also in my job uh, or in my studies. But certainly then it, it had just begun. I was 17, uh -huh. uh, but I had started to ask many questions. Right. Uh, here and there, I learned pretty soon that you had to always be careful who you would ask questions from, uh, to whom you would address your questions. Uh, but yes, uh, you were. And I wasn't quite sure at all anymore right. what exactly I could or could not uh, uh, just believe yeah and I already did not any do any evolving uh, opinions or understanding about the government and the world and you know the government no 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 not that uh, the world yes <laughs> yeah uh, the, the politics uh -huh. uh, especially the, the troubles between the Netherlands and England over the centuries. They were uh -huh. always having trouble with each other. They right. were always uh, vying for the domination of first the seas, the oceans, because the Dutch and the English were the big powers for a long time on the oceans. Right. The, the Dutch had an enormously powerful fleet, uh, both commercial and military. 
but then later also for colonies. Uh, the British had India and the Dutch had many settlements on the coasts of India, the west coast as well as the east coast, mm -hmm. and they had uh, in the, right. the Indies, the Dutch East Indies. Uh, oh. So they were always fighting with one another. Yeah. And immediately after the war ended, came these troubles there between Britain and the Dutch about what about those colonies? Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> yeah. So you're reunited with your brother and your mother in Singapore. In Singapore. And there I discovered that they had managed to get some communication with my father. With your father. And also your older brother? Is that no, not yet? No, that was Australian. He, right. He didn't, he didn't quite. Well, there were some letters. Okay. To PS, right. Yes. yes. Actually, he, after a few months, gave us an invitation to come to Australia to recuperate oh. from the war, uh, which we seriously considered for a while. And my father was in, in, in Bondo, and that's where after the war, he had gotten into music and also again into school. And he became actually the music director of the town of of Bandu, and as he led the choir, and an orchestra was beginning, and he got a very nice offer to become more permanently the music director of the city, as well as a teacher in the high school there. Mm -hmm. See, the Dutch at that time still thought that they were going to come back, uh, but the situation was very iffy. There were all those Pemudas and more and more the regular Indonesian army who were occupying most of Java, mm. actually. It was Jakarta, and it was Bandung, and it was Sabarang, and it was Surabaya that were occupied by either the British or later the Dutch. Mm -hmm. Most of Java was in the hands of the Indonesians, right. and they were not about to make peace yet. Mm. And was even more troublesome, the Dutch in the Hague were not about to make peace. Uh -huh. They just wanted their Dutch East Indies back, back as the Dutch East Indies. Right. And that was that was dumb. They didn't see what had happened during the Second World War. Mm. They had no idea in the Hague of what had happened during the war in the Indonesians mm. in, in uh, Indonesia and uh, the Dutch there didn't know either because they were all in concentration camps, right. the Japanese. And there had been an enormous amount of Japanese propaganda, Asia for the Asians, mm -hmm. and that had really got hold with the young in the Indies. Right. Not with the older ones. They had had it good under the Dutch, right. mostly. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was, that was difficult there. Mm -hmm. But, okay, so it was a decision to be made, and uh, we seriously discussed going back from Singapore to Java, or to go from Singapore to Australia, or to go from Singapore to the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And finally it was decided, let's all go to the Netherlands mm -hmm. for the kids. Safety, school, better future, who knows what will happen here was my father's reaction. Okay. So then uh, my mother, my younger brother and I got a ship in uh, the end of March 1946 to the Netherlands. My father got on a boat from Java in the end of May 46 to the Netherlands. Okay. And that's where we landed as refugees for a really entirely new life uh -huh. again. <laughs> okay, so the last, uh, everybody just went, got to meet in the Netherlands, except your uh, older, older brother. brother. So to pick it up there, what was that like? Where, so everybody comes by boat yes. into Rotterdam or where are you landing? Rotterdam. Yeah. Yes. So what was that like? 
Well, it was a miserable day, I can tell you that. I remember that. It was April 10th. It was still cold and it was rainy and windy. And most of us on that boat were still in our tropical get-ups because well, we had come straight from Singapore and we had stopped on the way in a little place in the Egyptian desert to get from the Red Cross some uh, clothes for, for when we would get to the colder areas. But we didn't wear those yet on the boat. Uh, so most of us were miserably cold. So were we. But at least we were there and the new life uh, uh, was waiting for us. There were buses waiting for people. Most of them would be transported to temporary, uh, not even homes, but, but places where they could at, at least stay for a little while until they would find their way further into the country. Now, we had already, by correspondence, uh, a place with an aunt and uncle mm -hmm. of ours in Rotterdam. She was a sister of my father's, okay. and he worked in an uh, institute for the blind, mm -hmm. and they had a comfortable house right smack in the middle of, of Rotterdam. Uh, not precisely in the center, but very close to it. You could walk it. And uh, uh, he had already, for me, uh, found a high school close by, Christian high school, where I probably would be able to go. He didn't know in what grade that would be. Now remember, we had had five years without school. Mm -hmm. This would be a new experience for me. What was the last grade you remember you were in? Well, then? that was halfway into the first one. This was a high school that has five grades, uh, so-called uh, HBS. Mm -hmm. It's a, a higher school for bourgeois, mm -hmm. <laughs> the bourgeois, bourgeois. And uh, during the war, during the occupation by the Japanese, my mother had found, through friends, a teacher of uh, uh, mathematics and another one for physics. And she taught us some French and English. Uh, so we were not just in the first half still of that high school, but uh, especially in mathematics, I was a good deal farther ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, but we had no idea where that would fit. Uh, and the English hadn't meant all that much, and the French hadn't meant all that much. So it was basically a, a guess or, or a, a, a gamble where they would place me. Mm -hmm. But we would find that out during the summer. Uh, so we stayed with that aunt and uncle for two years, about. Mm -hmm. There was just enough room for us. They had two boys, but one of them went into the army very quickly. So there was basically only one who was a student at a university uh, to become a minister. Uh, my father joined us during the summer. Uh, he came the end of June, something like that, because he had left uh, the Dutch Indies in May. And it did took easily four weeks to get by boat from the tropics there to uh, the Netherlands. And I remember that uh, boat, rise, uh, boat trip from Singapore to the Netherlands is one of the real high points mm -hmm. in my life. I liked it. Mm -hmm. I liked the sea voyage more than any other kind of trip I've ever been. What kind of boat was it then? It was in New Amsterdam. 
Oh. But remember, the New Amsterdam before the war was a luxury cruise ship. But during the war, it was a troop transport ship. Right. And that's what it remained after the war until it was put in a dock and not really repaired all that much. And then finally, the companies built a brand new New Amsterdam. But this was the New Amsterdam, so a little bit of it was still recognizably a cruise ship. Right. The remnants of it. But it was a troop, troop transport ship. And there were about 3,000 refugees then that left Singapore and arrived in Rotterdam. We went straight to Rotterdam through the Suez Canal. And that was one of the more romantic and uh, uh, risky venture because the New Amsterdam was a big boat and it barely fit through that Suez Canal. Mm. And I remember how at a given moment we were all told, don't stand just on the left side of the boat looking at the side to be seen because that would make the boat hell uh, uh, move Let's, too much list yeah. uh, to the right mm -hmm. or whatever it was, the left. Mm -hmm. And that would scrape the canal and that would be terrible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was it, it was really eerie to see that big ship uh, no more than a foot away from either side of the canal. And, uh, it, it, was, it was scary. Yeah. Uh, but it was of course very exciting. And uh, to get to Cairo was exciting, and then the middle, uh, uh, what's it called now? The, the, the middle lake? No, uh, the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. uh, for us, it was the Middle Land Sea, uh -huh. Middle Ocean Sea. Uh, okay, so the Mediterranean, and then the Gibraltar, and then up the Atlantic Ocean for a day, and then we were in Britain, in, in, in Southampton, and that's where we uh, had all the British and Scottish soldiers land. There were a lot of those on, on board the ship, and uh, that's where I learned a little bit of colloquial English. Mm. <laughs> and then we went to Rotterdam the next day, and we got there early in the morning. And with the bus, we were brought to the house of my aunt and uncle in Rotterdam City. So, yeah, then it was, okay, off to school to find right. out. So let me ask you, your dad... He was still in Indonesia. Okay. He, he was still trying to get passage to the Netherlands. Right, but he eventually does. He but does. then he only joined you for the summers? No, no, he was yeah. there for the summer, and then we stayed in in the Netherlands. We didn't go back. Okay, but he stayed too. He didn't go back. No, 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 no. He, he got the job quickly again, teaching. Okay. Too quickly, because it took too much out of him. Uh -huh. He died uh, in 1952, so it was only six years later uh -huh. that he, he died after having had a massive stroke uh -huh. two years before. So okay. he really worked only a little more than four years uh -huh. of 46 to 50. Mm -hmm. uh, and he worked very hard and, and of course had to try to uh, well, get going again. Mm -hmm. Well, for me then it was a matter of first of all finding school to go to. So I went to that, that uh, high school and asked to be tested. So, so I was tested on a number of a few subjects. Uh, mathematics, the most important mathematics, several different types of mathematics, and uh, uh, English and Dutch and French. I had to translate. Mm. Um, uh, and they said, Well, in September you can come here, and it looks like third grade. Although in mathematics you might join the fourth grade, 
but I was pretty good in, in, in math in those days. Okay. So I said, uh, well, let me try the fourth grade. You can always put me back. Mm. Well, it was okay. So for mm. September, I was scheduled to start uh, in that fourth grade. So the, the school would take me two years to finish instead of having to start all over. Right, fourth and fifth then, right? Just the fourth and fifth grade, right. yeah. And that's high school, just so that that's we... That's high school, yeah. Yeah, that, so it's well, five grades of high school. That's, well, hmm. that's one of the college prep high school. Okay. You you had in those days in the Netherlands different kinds of high schools. Right. Uh, most of them did not prepare to go to university. There was no such thing as college. You either went into a particular uh, professional... Occupation, uh, right. Occupational... Uh, study and you, you made it to the end, a doctoral study, or uh, you didn't go to the university. Uh, or you, you went to the university but you failed, which was true for maybe half of the ones that started the uh, college prep uh, high school and then uh, of those that were making it to the end of the high school uh, many went to the university, but of those that did, uh, easily have never made it to the end. So they, they didn't finish a professional study, but had to get something else going for them. It was a very elite kind of uh, selection business in those days. Right. Later, the American model became much more popular. And uh, so that changed things. But I still had to do the old-fashioned way of doing it. And this high school did not prepare you to uh, for certain studies at the university that required Latin and possibly Greek. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't become a minister, you couldn't become a lawyer, you couldn't study philosophy. You had to do with one of the, the other ones that were left. You could go to a a high school that would prepare you for all of them mm. and that's where you would start right away in the first grade with Latin and later Greek and mythology and a lot more history than in the other high schools and that high school would take six years mm. and there I would not have been able to begin again in the fourth grade. Right. I would have at least started I would have had to start at least in second grade. Maybe I could have skipped the first one, mm. but I hadn't had any Latin. Right. And, uh, Where did you pick up on French? When I, uh, my mother had a degree in, oh. in uh, teaching French. Okay. Uh, that she had uh, gotten in the Netherlands right. when she was there for her high school education. Right. And, you know, uh, so she taught. English. So you French. got a little homeschooling during that period? A of, little bit, yeah. yeah. Uh, and my mother saw to it that I got, especially mathematics, because that would be the most important huh. uh, of the high school subjects that that uh, would help me to advance beyond the first couple grades. Mm -hmm. I should mention, though, my real at evocation and what was supposed to become my vocation was the violin music. Tell me about it. Which that. I had started already in the Indies, mm. in the town of Medan, when I was 10 years old. And uh, I had some feeling for it, and it went quite well. But yeah, then came the war with the Netherlands, and my teacher was an Austrian. Mm. So he was promptly put in a camp for Germans and Austrians. My father did find another violin teacher, a Dutchman, and so I had some lessons from him, but then we moved to Surabaya, and he, we couldn't find a good teacher for me there. Mm. So during the occupation, I tried by myself to continue playing the violin and, and practicing and, and making some headway, but also learning some bad habits 
Mm. <laughs> than, that any good teacher would have stopped me from doing right. it. But I still wanted to become a violinist. Mm. And my father was all for it too. Uh, he was a musician, uh, basically. Uh, more so even than the teaching that he did as a, as a job. So in the Netherlands, uh, I right away had to try to pick up again some good teaching. And I went to the conservatory in Rotterdam and uh, they tested me and uh, I got assigned to one of their good violin teachers who eventually became the concertmaster, first concertmaster of the Amsterdam Concertgebouw well Orchestra, mm -hmm. one of the major orchestras in Europe. So I had a good teacher in him mm -hmm. right away. So that was really wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I still, at that time, even though I really was too old by that time, mm -hmm. but I still thought I would make it as a violinist. I was too optimistic, but mm -hmm. okay. And the teacher wanted to teach me, so that was really my major occupation. But I did go to that high school, and I did manage to uh, catch up with the other students in that fourth grade with mathematics. I was okay, and uh, so I had to catch up with several other subjects like history and, and uh, physics. And, chemistry and so on, but I managed to do that and uh, eventually graduated from that high school with decent grades so I could go to the university. And by that time, the choice was, well, okay, what do you do now? Mm -hmm. Are you going to the conservatory in Amsterdam uh, and studying violin or, or, or what? And that's when my father, very wise man, said, look, well, then you can always keep playing. You can always, if you're good enough, find a good job in a decent orchestra or as a teacher. But do me a favor, go to the university. Pick anything you want. I don't care what you pick, but go to the university. Hmm. So I looked at how I would have liked to start in philosophy, but I couldn't do that with the diploma I had from the high school. I didn't have Latin or Greek mm. to start that from scratch. I didn't feel like So I took psychology, uh -huh. not because I wanted to become a psychologist. But I was interested in it. I had read some Freud, you know, that kind of stuff in high school and some other things that are very psychological uh, uh, books and, and so on. So I picked psychology at the university in Amsterdam, one of the two that they had there. One was a public university, the other was a Christian university. Yeah. I picked the Christian one because they said that they are better when it comes to practical psychology. Uh, and what the was the name one. of it? The, the Free University. Oh, it was the Free because University. Because the founder had wanted a Christian university he was a preacher and a politician, but he did not want it to be a church school. Mm. So his slogan became <coughs> free of church and school and uh, state. Uh -huh. Free of church and state. Okay. That's why he called it the Free University. Okay. He, he was a, quite a big man in the Netherlands uh, of a Christian political party, but he, for a while, became one of the more important Dutch prime ministers mm. in, the, in the government. But he remained a preacher all his life, too. Uh, so I went to that university. Uh, but I continued studying the violin mm. with my violin teacher, mm -hmm. a fellow by the name of Ferdinand Hellman who by that time, when I got to the university, was the first concertmaster in the Amsterdam Orchestra, wow. which was really nice. And, uh, I got that way to hear more of the music in reality in that beautiful concert hall that they have in Amsterdam. It's a place where 
so many great musicians liked to come. Yehudi Menuhin, for instance, was there every year for many years, mm. and uh, pianists and violinists and cello players and so on. So that, that, that was still my goal, to become a violinist. And my teacher, Hellman, said, well, yeah, you can always, always find a job in a, in a decent orchestra. Whether you can be a soloist, I doubt it. Mm. And I thought, well, I'll show you. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. How, how, what did I know? Uh, coming fresh from the farm. What's happening with your living situation? Are you... Oh, we were the first two years living in Rotterdam. Right. And I, I commuted with the uh, university in Amsterdam uh, after I graduated from the high school. But after those first two years, my parents got a rental place, uh, one floor in, an, uh, in a rental home. In Amsterdam or in, no, in Rotterdam, oh, in Rotterdam. Rotterdam. Okay. where my father has found a job okay. teaching again. So we had that, that home in Rotterdam. After I graduated from high school, uh, we had our own place. Hmm. Uh, sometimes it was a little hard on the neighbors because I was practicing that violin hmm. four to six hours a day. Wow. And hearing somebody just play scales and, and studied studies is not always pleasant for people to hear. Mm. The other floor was by a younger couple, and they didn't mind too much. Mm. They closed their doors and turned on their radio, and that was it. Um, so there I was in Amsterdam as a student at the university, beginning to take some courses in psychology, but she didn't have any general education anymore, like here in college. You just right away started in a particular discipline, and mm. that was it. So I had to take courses in psychology and didn't mind. I liked it. Mm. It, was, it was good stuff that they taught there. Also, more oriented than here in colleges, usually, uh, more oriented towards the practical applications of it, mm. uh, testing and uh, talking about therapy methods and theories and so on. Uh, and I, I liked that. I always liked theory a lot. And I began to really enjoy the more practical aspects of it. And I studied the violin very hard. Mm -hmm. And I didn't take exams mm -hmm. at the university because I thought, well, I'm going to be a violinist anyway, mm -hmm. so I don't have to. Now, you should know that in those days still, at the university, you didn't have any other exams than individual oral exams with the prof. And when you felt you were ready for it, you asked for an examination. Hmm. And the prof would say, well, come then and then, there and there, often in his own home. And he would grill you for you know, one to two hours, and you would pass or not. Hmm. Uh, and if you didn't, he might be gracious and say, well, why don't you come back in three months? Or if it wasn't good at all, he would say, well, come back in a half year. And if he wanted you out of the university, he would say, well, why don't you see after a year if you still feel ready for it? Mm. <laughs> That's why so many people never made it to the mm. end. Uh, and I never took one of those exams. I, oh. didn't, I didn't care. Because uh, I was going to be a violinist anyway. Mm. Trouble is that policy was that uh, the military service in the Netherlands still had the draft. And when you were 18, you were supposed to be drafted. And I had been uh, medically examined and I was okay. Mm. But if you were a student at a university or some other schools, uh, you could get a deferment, but not for more than four years. Three, three and a half, four years. And if you then had not at least completed a number of exams, you were drafted. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't take too many exams. Fortunately, though, after the first two years, the students in psychology had to take some practicals. 
So you had to sit in in a place where they actually did psychological work. And for me, that was the Psychological Institute at that free university, mm. where they did a lot of testing of children, school children, high school uh, students, uh, problem children, adults for personnel departments in various businesses. So they had all around practice of applied psychology. It was actually called the Laboratory for Applied Psychology mm. of the Free University. Mm. Uh, so it, it was an institute. And so I took my first practicum. And that went so well, I liked it so much, that I also did pretty good, apparently. Because you had to write reports on, on what you witnessed and so on, and you had to write something on tests that you had learned something about, that after those first two years, they offered me a job mm -hmm. as a beginning assistant at that institute where I would learn more about it. And it so happened that just around that time, my father got a stroke, mm -hmm. a very serious stroke, and he would be handicapped and he could no longer support me uh, going to the university. Mm -hmm. So I had to get a job. And I wasn't far enough ahead in the violin studies to be able to get a job <coughs> in an office orchestra. Uh, so I took the job in that institute as a beginning assistant, which is, by the way, also where I met for the first time my wife mm. to be, who was a fellow student at the university in psychology and had also become an assistant, mm. beginning assistant at that institute. So at least I had enough money to keep myself alive and uh, I'd go to Amsterdam and rent a one room in a, in a boarding house with other people. And I liked the, the work in the institute. I made headway. And then came the draft, mm -hmm. two years, a year and a half later. And I could not say, I have had so many exams done, because I hadn't done practically any of them. I had done two, I think, mm -hmm. out of the first 15 or 16 that you had to take. So I was drafted. I had to go to the army, which was in Amsterdam too. Mm. The uh, uh, recruits with me were stationed in Amsterdam. So I got the first six months there, and that's when we had our great adventure of the floods. The flooding of a large part of the Netherlands, mm -hmm. the southwest part. And the dikes broke in a storm. That it's about 54 they, they or so, isn't it? That. that was the, 50 the, the end of January 53. 53, yeah. And that's when we recruits from Amsterdam, almost done with the recruit uh, education, uh, were sent to the Paris and Netherlands to help in, uh, well, saving some people. And, 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 Cattle and, and uh, my job became with a lot of others to watch uh, on the dike that was still left, the one dike on that particular island uh, that was still standing, to watch through the night to see if any water was beginning to seep through at the bottom of the dike because that was, was always the beginning. Uh, and <laughs> to take a spade and get clay from the bottom mm. of that island. I've never realized in my life how heavy mm. clay can be. <laughs> and that was hard work, I'll tell you. Well, that took a month. And uh, so then our recruit uh, education was over and uh, I went to officer school, mm. which was nice. Because, uh, well, at least you have a future with a little bit more pay. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it took six months longer, but you at least had a decent, decent future in the army ahead. 
So I made it through the officer school, became a lieutenant, and they didn't know what to do with me. I wasn't the military type, so they didn't want to make me commander of some platoon somewhere. And they had the perfect spot for me. I had studied psychology. Mm. <laughs> Not that I knew much about it, but at least I had three and a half years of psychology. What about the and violin? Then, Did you have that? Was that uh, of use to, to the military uh, at all? No, I had to give that up ah. uh, while I was in the military. Okay. I couldn't play. Uh, and uh, uh, that, that was my undoing for the violin, mm. really. And so uh, they made me personnel selection officer mm. in Amsterdam. Because oh, of your psychological yeah, understanding. Yeah, I didn't know what that meant, and I didn't <laughs> tell them either. Uh, and so I became the assistant to a captain who had been pushed into that job because they didn't know what to do with him mm. either. And they had to have somebody to look at all those recruits. This was the quartermaster mm. uh, recruits. And so after the recruiting was over, uh, those would have to be dispersed all over the armed forces uh, in many different jobs. That's what quartermaster does. Some would be a chauffeur, some would be a, uh, someone to help in officer's mess, some would become cooks, some would learn how to sew, <laughs> and all kinds of jobs for those. And they needed somebody to select them out. Mm -hmm. And they always had found somebody to do that who didn't do very well. And they thought, ah, there's the psychology student. <laughs> he should be able to. He has even worked in personnel selection testing and so on. So that was the job of my life there for <laughs> almost two years, for a good year and a half. Mm -hmm. And it was in Amsterdam too, which was nice for me there, because of the music environment that was, of course, still going on there. And I, I became the assistant to that captain who didn't know what to do either with this whole business. And I could help him actually. Mm. And we improved our selection procedures uh, a good deal after the first half year. So they wanted to keep me in that job. They even offered me uh, another two years if I wanted to stay in the army. Mm. But by that time, I'm fairly decent officer lieutenant's uh, salary. But now I wanted to go back. And by that time I decided, talking also to my violin teacher, mm. better go into psychology, mm. which I'd come to like. A right. Lot. I'm just wondering about any, um, you know, just growing up a little bit in the Netherlands and they're sort of, uh, you know, innovative ideas of so many things. And I remember that when I was there after I was in college in, in Italy, uh, and my relatives would see a Dutch soldiers and they would go, oh, there's Nederlands of Hope, you know, like almost in a mocking kind of way, right? Yeah. Because the soldiers the could have the... long hair yeah. and they could have to wear hair nets. Was there anything in your work with the psychology of the Dutch military that you could talk about it all or say they had any influence on? That all came after I had left. Okay. See, this was in 1952 right. that I began. And the Netherlands was just beginning to get out of the total devastation that the war had left right. for the Dutch. Uh, you, you can say between 45 and 55 was when the Dutch had to climb out of the misery. That's when also so many people were actually encouraged to emigrate. Yeah, that's my family. That's they not only encouraged, subsidized. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. the third wave of, of emigrants. Right. Especially to Canada mm. and the United States and Australia and New Zealand. Fewer, but still. That was between 45 and 55. Right. And 50, 55. 55. 54 and 55, right. Not 45 and 40. Yeah, that's when the Netherlands had to climb out right. of the devastation after the war. Right. So that took some 10 years. Yes. Uh, 45 was the end of the war, May 45. Fifth, yes, 45 was 45, the end. 45, yep. yeah. Uh, 
after 55, that's when the real change began. Uh -huh. Until that time, it was just trying to make do and get rid of as many people as, as we can. Right. Because we are now poorly devastated still right. in so many respects. The military was functioning somewhat still as of old. So I didn't have to meet any of those new things that began to develop after 1960. Uh -huh. Now, I got out in 1954, mm -hmm. uh, the end of 1954, out of the army. Mm -hmm. I had had a little over two years of the army. I had been an officer for a year and a half. That was enough for me. Okay. And I had a job waiting for me, I had been told, at that institute if I wanted to. As in, uh, now a third class assistant instead of the fourth class, mm -hmm. which was my first uh, part uh, of a uh, job there. So it was actually, you might say, after 1960 that the new Netherlands came about. Mm. That's when also the famous 60s and 70s started going. But that was still not true when I got out of the army. Right. So I didn't have any of that. It was still the old, old time army mm -hmm. uh, that, that I had there. It wasn't bad, mm -hmm. but it, it was nothing new. But then came the 60s, and then the Netherlands started booming. Actually, the war helped a good deal for the planning that had already taken place during that war, the occupation. Mm -hmm. The Germans picked up most of the intellectuals and government officials and put them in intern camp in the Netherlands. So what were they going to do? Just sit around there? They started planning. Mm -hmm. They were convinced that, of course, Germany would lose eventually. Mm -hmm. And then what? What will we do after the war? And a lot of planning for post-war Netherlands was made in those internment camps under Chaplin, uh, German occupation. Well, I never heard that. That's no, right. and, and uh, I didn't know that either when we came there. But that's what I found out later. Mm -hmm. and so when the Netherlands finally began to climb out of the doldrums right after the war, they had a lot of plans ready to, for instance, this was the major thing, change from a still mostly agricultural uh, society to a more commercial and uh, industrial society. That had all been sort of planned before that. Also, the cooperation between the different political parties mm. and the religions had been planned in, uh, in the core. Uh, it all had to be realized after the war, and that took a while before it got going, but there had been those conversations between people. Mm -hmm. and so that's when we see political parties become much more cooperative with each other after the war than they had been before the war. That's when we see religions become much more cooperative and doing things together uh, than before the war. During the war, they had learned. Roman Catholics and Protestants, mm -hmm. who hated each other before the war very often, to have services in their churches combined. That is, the one in the, in the morning and the other in the afternoon okay. or, or whatever. So they had come a different kind of mentality in the Netherlands, and that became realized in those 60s and 70s. And you can't say right. when the end of the 70s were around, the Netherlands was way on top again. Right. Tolerance is a word lot. that comes to mind, yeah. right? That's when they had developed models for working together. The, so the, the famous Polder model. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, that's when commerce and, and industry had really been developed. Uh, and then I was, was pioneering in a number of mm -hmm. branches there. Think of, of the industries like Philips mm -hmm. in electronics in computer science they mm -hmm. started uh, already then little by little 
the Dutch world champion chess mm -hmm. in the 1930s, mm. became a professor of computer science in the 19, early 1970s or late 1960s in the Netherlands, mm. at the, one of the universities there. So that there were many innovative things going on there. And commerce in Rotterdam, after the war, built like not big. It became the busiest harbor in the world right. for a while. Uh, and then came, of course, places like Tokyo. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so by that time, no emigration anymore. When I came to the late 70s and early 80s, particularly, they started importing, which became a problem in its own right mm -hmm. later with uh, politics and, and, and mixed marriages and so on between Islam and, and, and the Netherlands right. uh, churches. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I didn't have any of that in my military right. uh, service there. So you go back to work for the uh, So I went back to work as an assistant. At the Applied Third Psychology now, Institute. And psychology. And that went quite well. Mm -hmm. uh, I made had very as an assistant there, still didn't take my exams too much. Uh, the lonely one here, another lonely one there, but <laughs> for the rest, uh, I, I wanted to do the practice and I, right. learned, I studied. I studied very hard. What were some of the things you were doing there as, as that third? Well, class? I did an awful lot of testing. Okay. Testing of kids, okay. testing of adults testing for school choice, testing for therapy choice, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of testing of kids with problems, adults with problems, and little by little more counseling of parents with problem children and mm -hmm. so on. So I went through the ropes, as it were, year after year for a while, uh, from 1954 through most of 1956. And by that time, I reached the rank of first class assistant. Okay. So as my wife, except she was two years ahead of me by then, because mm. she didn't have military service. Wow. So I was sometimes her assistant. Okay. Uh, and uh, that was kind of nice. Mm -hmm. uh, and she had a better salary than I had, of course, which was later when we began to get together more, uh, nice, and then at the end of 1956, I was told by the boss, the director, now listen, you have reached sort of the assistant right? <coughs> top, the next step would become chief psychologist, but you have to have your doctor exam first, mm -hmm. but I promise you, the sooner you get that doctorate behind you, you will become a chief psychologist. Mm. I thought, well, I guess it's time, because by the time my wife and I had started to get together more and had plans. So this, you, you had gotten married then? No, oh, okay. it, no, the end of 56, we were sort of convinced we would stay together. Okay. That's why that date comes up that later got into our wedding ring, uh -huh. which was July of 1956. Right. And uh, that's when we had promised each other mm -hmm. to stay together, come what may. But she was much closer to the doctor than I. Mm. And so all she still had to do was to write the doctoral thesis, mm -hmm. not dissertation. That is something extra after the normal doctoral title, okay. which, which in those days was called Dr. Randus for a male and Dr. Randa for a woman. That means he's got everything, he's got his whole professional training and his university training. He can now go into uh, practice. Hmm. If he, he can go to institute, he can work in business, he can set up private practice, therapy, but he's done. And there is an extra, and that is the PhD. Okay. That's doctor. 
and that, that goes all the way back to the Middle Ages. Uh -huh. and, and that's something on top of the completion of doctoral studies at the university. Okay. That's something independent, you have to find your own subject, you have to find your own, you have to get your own data, uh, you have to find a professor, senior professor, to sort of sponsor you. Right. If you, you get the degree at the university, uh, and that's a public thing, it's a, it's a defense to whoever wants to challenge you and is qualified to do that by having a doctorate already. <coughs> is that but unique that's like, to that is rare European system or that was then fairly common in Europe and certainly in the Netherlands. Okay. At all the universities. Is it different here in the in this oh, in yeah. the American here, system? You have to have your PhD. And that is a, a doctorate with a large thesis. Okay. The thesis for the doctorate in the Netherlands was not as big. Ah. That was more to the satisfaction of your major professors in the department. And uh, if they were satisfied, then okay. Uh, you, you got your doctorandus or your doctoranda. It's more like an exam then in the in the Dutch system? No, you have to write. You have to okay, write a thesis. To, right. uh, uh, but it's not as large as an no, original no, it's, it's not an, manuscript. It's not an independent uh, scholarly uh, contribution to the discipline, okay. which has to go to all the uh, journals and to all the libraries and to all the faculty in your university. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to try to get the money together for that. Mm -hmm. No, that's a much bigger kind of thing. And few people do that, uh -huh. did that, I should say. Oh. Uh, what they have now, I'm, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. They now have a bachelor and a master's and a PhD. Mm -hmm. So I think the PhD is still... Terminal. Uh, uh, no, the PhD is that extra. Oh, okay. The terminal is now, I think, I'm not sure, called master's. Oh. But it's a, it's a master's that's an equivalent to what used to be the doctorandus okay. or the doctoranda. Ah. It's very, very complicated. Yeah. And I'm not entirely... Okay. So what's with your story? What happens well, next here? Well, uh, my wife-to-be and I did want to get married before long. Uh, and I did want to make that final step to become a chief psychologist, so it was about time for me to start taking exams. And uh, well, uh, while my wife was working on her thesis, I uh, started taking exams mm. like you wouldn't believe. Really? And uh, fortunately, of course, the material I pretty much knew. Mm. Because I'd been studying hard those years, so it, it wasn't that I was a beginning student. And reading a lot and keeping had, up with the I journals. I read a lot and I learned a lot, of course, in, mm -hmm. as an assistant. Uh, I, I'd worked a lot in the, in the areas of psychology. So for me, it was not like I, was, I had to start all over. Right. Uh, and I did manage to get it done in, in a year. Uh, the, the studies, which usually take two, three years mm. after you have the, the middle level. The middle level took me about a half year to do, and then uh, another year for the rest. And by that time, my wife had, my wife to be, had finished her uh, thesis for her doctorate. And as the good Lord, we used to say then <laughs> would have it. We did our doctoral exam the same day. Mm. She went in an hour earlier than I to get our comprehensive exams out of the way, uh, exam out of the way, and uh, uh, she will always be my senior. Mm. <laughs> Was this the same committee that you had to appear before, or was it a different group? No, at first it was separate exams. It's, uh, it's individual professors. Mm -hmm. And then comes the middle level, what they call the candidates exam. Ah. That was a small committee of the, of the uh, uh, department. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after that, you get to the doctoral. That's a different committee. 
but now senior professors of your department mm. and somebody from another department. Mm. Uh, so it usually was three or four that examine you at length for the doctoral. And uh, well, we did have the same people because it was one after the other. Okay. Uh, but that, that could be arranged, uh, fortunately, on the same day. And so we had the same same people. Mm -hmm. But at every exam, it could be a different group of four or five uh, professors. But for the doctor, it was always the senior professors. Mm. So we both graduated in that year, 57. But, uh, we got married mm. officially. Mm -hmm. For us, we had been together. Made that commitment. We had made that commitment before. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like what, a year before or two, two, 56? Well, we, we were married in 57 in September and we made our vows to each 50, other in July of 56. 56. Yeah, so almost yeah. a year and a half. And yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good, beautiful story. Oh, we, 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 we thought of that, and, and our family by that time had no objections anymore. Uh -huh, right. <laughs> my wife's family. My family never, because my father was dead by that time, and right. my mother saw that everything I did was okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's the story then up to and including the degree of Dr. Ramnes for me and Dr. To run that for my wife, and right. they both were now chief psychologists. The, the, the director, um, well, kept his word. Kept his promise. On the late afternoon of the day I got my doctoral exam passed, I got wind, uh, word that I was now chief psychologist and I could sign my own uh, diagnostic reports or whatever. Right. And, uh, we were colleagues now. And My so what was the nature of the work? Did the nature of the work change for you at well, all? I was much more independent. Okay. Uh, the uh, director would get requests for uh, examinations for psychological advice and testing. Mm -hmm. And then he would uh, select this particular case and dole it out to that particular chief psychologist. Mm -hmm. We had about six of them by that time. Is this uh, pretty much strictly working along Freudian oh, lines? No. Oh no, Freud was never that big. Okay. Well, he was big, of course, in those days, uh, that was still one of the founders. Right. But at the university where I was, the Christian University, it was actually much more young. Okay. Uh, I started studying Jung as a beginning student at the university okay. and heard about him in colleges. And uh, for application, Jung was certainly much bigger than Freud in that institute mm. because uh, Jung was also very practical. Right. He, he had a lot of innovations in practical psychology particularly when it comes to things like personality theory and so on. And uh, so we used a lot of his language mm. uh, to characterize the work we did and the diagnostics that we made. Uh, so you was bigger. And then came the existentialists okay. right after the war. And they were big in the Netherlands too. Mm. Uh, so we were quite familiar with the ideas of people like Jean-Paul Sartre mm -hmm. and, and other... Right. What about Lacan? What, uh, that comes much later. Comes that later. is in the uh, 80s and 90s. Oh, that late? Yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for us it was Merleau-Ponty uh -huh. uh, uh, and people like Bergson hmm. uh, and, and of course we read and that influenced psychology right. too. Uh, people like Camus or Camus. Mm -hmm. Albert, <laughs> right. <coughs> so it was a mix of a little bit of Freud, a lot of Jung, a lot of the more existential. Was there a sense of 
excitement and discovery with some of these oh, theories yeah. because especially the existentialists or, uh -huh. as we learned to call them phenomenologists right uh, that that was much more in the Netherlands in those days than old Freud old Freud was sort of passé especially his his uh, long term therapy right and some of his ideas but a lot of what the man discovered remains forever I mean, he discovered that there is such a thing as unconscious uh, dynamics <clears throat> when people end up doing things without realizing why it is they're doing it. Right. Well, you know, there was a, <coughs> a British series that came out in this, maybe it was the 80s, called The Century of the Self. Have you heard of that? It's a four four part series by a British, you know, Channel 4 which is the famous, you know, public Yeah, television. maybe I have even seen that, but I don't Well, it gets into the Edward Bernays and uh, public relations, and Edward Bernays is nephew of Freud and uses a lot of Freudian theory to create the public relations advertising oh, industry. Yeah, and no, that, that we never became very familiar with in my days yeah. in the Netherlands. I don't know about after. Right. Was what was the atmosphere like for you in terms of, I asked you earlier about your evolving worldview. Well, How was this influencing your psychology? Un the free university was free also of church. Right. And so we were much more free to explore on our own whatever we wanted to explore. Okay. That was the idea of Abraham Kuyper, the, the founder of that university. Right. He wanted learning to be independent. Right. And you would go on on your own. So what kind of stuff work, work were you were doing at that point that you could well, share? Well, I got more and more into Jung. Okay. That became for my wife and me, also in our marriage, very important uh -huh. uh, to understand each other, understand ourselves together with the other, and to understand patients. We began to do more counseling. Uh -huh. uh, and so, in those days, uh, the existentialist second, Jung first for me, and and that's a big thing uh -huh. because it's very complicated, right. very complex. There's not just one Jung; there are the different developments that he went through in his psychology, right. and you begin with the with the. Uh, first form, which is more actual practical psychology, this is theory of personality and so on, and these ideas about therapy. But then after that come many other things, until finally you get to psychology of religion. Uh -huh. And I didn't come to that right away. Okay. It took years. Yeah. Where does the term self-actualization come into play? Well, that was Maslow. That's Maslow. That's yeah, later that, too, right? It's later. There's people right. like Maslow and Rogers. But Rogers. it seems like some of this union stuff is pointing to... Oh, yeah. This... Individuation and self-actualization right. is not all that different right. at all. And both of them are misunderstood by many Christians a whole lot because they think it's all about you, your ego. Uh -huh. It's not what self-actualization is about and certainly not what individuation as Jung calls it, right. is about there. The most important thing is to find that something beyond yourself mm. that is what now will guide your life. Right. It's also true in self-actualization. Well, and that's the part for me about, you know, reading about Jung and how committed he was to his own work as a human being, right? To, well, yeah. In his own dreams and building the, at, at what's the place where that he built by hand, which comes out of his own dream analysis and that he was so committed to this but then freud is so suspicious of it and you're taking us back to freud re religion to, and myths and all this yeah, stuff no, that hocus freud, pocus freud wanted to help people practically to deal with life as it is now is in your culture that was his own problem uh -huh. as a jew and growing up as a jewish boy right brilliant absolutely brilliant but nevertheless, always the discrimination and how do you make it in this world? Right. Not how do you make it in the world beyond this world, <laughs> which was much more going beyond that. 
uh, into Jungian right. type of thinking. Uh, no, uh, Freudians are in that regard much more practical. How do you adapt to what you find around you? That's not what Jung is about. You adapt to something much more than just what you can find around you. M much more mystical, would you would you say? You want to call it mystical? Yeah. Uh, than a very practical mysticism. Well, what a, yeah, that's James too, though, isn't it? Prag James and well, pragmatism. James, James and Jung. Uh, James pragmatism is yeah. often misunderstood too. Okay. He did not say, "Oh, you just do what is practical." He did not say that. Uh. He writes very clearly uh, in, in several of his work. Pragmatism is to find that which works the best and makes a difference to what your existence is. It's much more existential than it is practicalism. Uh, it is not utilitarianism, which people have made of it. Well, you do what, what you can use practically to get ahead now. That's not what William James was about. Mm. He goes much farther than that. Okay. Uh, if you read, for instance, his uh, uh, lectures on uh, the varieties of religious experience, right. it becomes very clear. He's not talking about uh, religion as something practical that you can use now in your daily life and have success with it. That's what people have made of it. Mm. Utilitarianism, you can call that fine. That, that's an attitude of life. That's not what James pragmatism is. Mm. Actually, he borrowed the term from uh, a, a previous philosopher who meant by it something that has to do with logic, mm. not, not, not with practical life. Right. Uh, so uh, that was the mistake that a lot of people made. And I've heard preachers on televangelistic television uh, make that mistake when they talk about you. Oh, that's all about the ego. That's all about yourself. Mm -hmm. That's not at all what you right. mean. And not self-actualization either. What's the association between existential existentialism and nihilism? That same kind of... Well, some, some existentialists were nihilists. Okay. But not all nihilists. Are existentialists. <laughs> there are other kinds of existentialism too. Uh -huh. uh, some of those that, that I had a little bit of a handle on were Merleau Ponty and, and Camus, and so they were not nihilists. Mm. They looked for ideals too. Even Sartre had his ideals when he got the Nobel Prize. It was out of principle that he said, I don't want it. Uh -huh. I don't go for that kind of honor. Mm. Uh, that was not uh, nihilism. Nihilism would say, oh, okay, I, I'll, I'll use that money. Uh -huh. uh, no, but there were those who saw it totally negative. Uh, the world and life in it and would say it's totally absurd. It doesn't make any difference. Uh -huh. If the world blows up, okay, so it blows up. What's the big deal? Uh, that's not all of the existentialists. Okay. 